like this were built, the speed limit was 40, maybe 45 miles an hour. So to cruise at 50 or even 60, well, that was unbelievable. And this thing will effortlessly cruise at 70 or 80. Yeah, this car was capable of uh, going over 100 miles an hour, yeah. which was insane for not only the time, but the weight and, and everything. Uh, this car had 250 horsepower back in 1933. Welcome to that episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Once again, being visited by automotive royalty, 1933 Hispano Suiza V12. This is from the legendary Nethercott collection, which is in Silmar, California, about eight miles here from my garage. If you're ever in the California area, it is just a fascinating place to visit because you will see, you know, everybody's got GTOs and Mustangs and all kinds of stuff, and they have some of that too, but they have the really rare ones. This was one of the most brilliant cars of all time. This is designed by a man named Mark Burkett. Have you never heard that name? It's certainly up there with W.O. Bentley and Lanchester and, and uh, the Duesenberg brothers. He was Swiss. He founded Hispano Sueza. Uh, he, he founded a company in Spain. He combined it with Swiss, Hispano Sueza. That's where it came from. A legendary designer. He designed, uh, well, everything. He designed the 20 millimeter cannon. You know, when you watch those old movies and the propeller goes around and the bullets fire in between the propeller, you know, for World War I fighter planes and World War II as well. He developed that mechanism. He developed uh, a power servo for the brakes, which Rolls Royce and everybody used for years and years. Uh, he made the linkage to allow you to hook mechanical brakes to the front wheel of a car. See, the, the reason old cars only had brakes on the rear is because you had rods going back. You press the brake and the rod would pull the brake. When you turned the wheel, oh, the rods would pull and the car would. So that's why a lot of cars did not have front brakes because hydraulic brakes had not yet been invented. And he developed the linkage that would flex that would allow the, it to move and still have a metal rod go to the front. I mean, he's just a brilliant, brilliant engineer. This was his crowning glory. He built probably the premier luxury car, the 20s, I think certainly ahead of the Rolls-Royce, the H6 Hispano Sueza. And this was, I think, the greatest car he ever built. Let's bring Cameron Richards in. He's vice president of another car collection. Tell us a little bit more about it. Come on in, Cameron. How are you? I'm great, Jay. How are you well, doing? Well, thanks for bringing this. This is a car I have read about. I've seen at your collection. It really is one of the greatest cars of all time because Mark Burkett, he developed the first Aero V8 engine. That's the one that's in my old Hispano Suez where I have. It has bevel drive to overhead cams. It was built under license Wright Mart in the United States, Wolseley in England, Hispano Suez in France. And it was just an amazing, amazing engine. And this was his follow up to uh, using all the aeronautical things he learned in developing that engine. He built this more conventional v12 but all aluminum iron liners what body style is this uh, this is a j12 right. type 68 right. uh, they made a total of 120 of them up until 1938 and this and but not just this is just one of the uh, model 68 this particular, it's a two-door. Who did the, do you know the coach work? Yes, yeah, so the coach work was done by Henry Binder. Okay. And uh, this is one of only nine J12s that Henry Binder made. Right. And this is the only one that's sitting on a 146-inch wheelbase out of the other nine by Henry Binder. And that was a short wheelbase. Yeah, that was yeah. considered smaller. That was the smaller, sportier model, where the other one was, was even longer. Yeah, the biggest one was 157 and three-quarter inches. Right. And this car was beyond expensive. You know, Rolls Royces were very expensive. This was easily probably, if not twice the price of a Rolls Royce, pretty close. But it was a far superior car. Uh, Three-speed transmission because you didn't need four speeds because there was so much torque from this motor. You know, back in the day, uh, it was a selling point. We had three speeds instead of four because you has so much power, you save one shift. Oh, people didn't like to shift. You know, when the automatic came in, oh, that was the greatest invention in sliced bread. People just went crazy. You know, now we enthusiasts, we all want a four speed, you know. But this thing, you could put it in third gear. You could pull away in third gear almost in this thing. I wouldn't Absolutely. recommend it, but you could do it. But you could slow right down to four or five miles an hour, floor the accelerator and pull away smoothly. It's really a beautiful, just an amazing car. Uh, now, your grandfather bought this car, correct? Uh, great grandfather, great, JB. That's right, that shows how old I am. <laughs> now it's great grandfather, that's right. 
Uh, J.B. Nethercutt was one of these guys that was a visionary. He saw the value in these things long before anybody else did, you know. Most of these were sent to junkyards or torn apart or uh, just made into hot or whatever it might be. But he, uh, he, he was a guy, it was like finding a piece of uh, artwork from the, the Egyptian times and not realizing it's artwork, you know. I mean, yeah, just, just a beautiful design and a wonderful driving car. Now, although the Duesenberg brothers had perfected the mechanical, I mean, the hydraulic plate back in 22, this still had steel rods going to the front wheels, correct? Yep, mechanical four-wheel brakes, uh, servo-assisted. Yeah, and the servo used the vacuum off the engine, and it feels like a modern power brake. And, and in some ways, back in the day, I almost would have preferred this because, as Henry Ford used to say, the power of steel from pedal to wheel. You have a steel rod pushing and pulling on the brakes as opposed to a little copper tube with fluid in it, which just to most people go, you're stopping three tons. That seems like, what if the fluid le leaked out? Well, you, you know, you would have no brakes. So, but this, I don't think you could tell a difference from a modern power brake. It is so smooth and progressive. Yeah, you really can't. The brakes are actually uh, very phenomenal for the era. Uh, it kind of feels like you're driving a 1950s, 1960s muscle right. car. That was kind of the cool thing about these is that Hispanos were always years ahead of their times just in the way they drove. They were completely silent oh, yeah. and smooth. You know, these were legendary. I think one of these J12s, they drove it in one of these Monte Carlo rallies, blah, 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 the whole deal, up hills, down hills, all this kind of stuff. Then they drove it into the hotel in Monaco. They put white paper on the floor. They drove the car in, parked it, kept it there for two days, pulled it out. There was not a drop of coolant or oh, wow. oil I didn't know that. or anything on the floor. Yeah, it was pretty. It was one of those, ooh, 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 okay, this is good. Because, you know, by 1932, the automobile was here to stay. I mean, the writing was on the wall. Horses, everything else is gone. The so from the 30s on, the idea was to make it perfect. Cadillac had the V16, which was dead silent. This was dead silent. It didn't leak any fluid. Because most cars, you know, smelly, dirty, had to crank them, you know. Even these bumpers, now, is there, do you know, if, is there fluid in these? Do these work? No, maybe not. I don't no, think there is. Mainly no. just for yeah, good okay. looks. Because Packard has the same thing, but they had fluid in it to take out the harmonic balance of, of, of the, when going down the road. And this, this stork, there was a French ace. Now, as I said, Mark Burkett designed the first Aero V8. It was really the Aero engine that, run, that won World War I. The Germans had amazing planes, the Red Baron and all that. But those were usually inline sixes. This V8 with iron liners, it was an amazing piece of kit, this thing, an amazing motor. And GUI, M-E-R-E-R, -E Gamera, something like a, a, a French ace. He shot down so many German planes, he, be, he got the Legion of Honor, he got all the French awards. And he loved Hispanic ways, and he was a friend of Mark Burkett. So Mark Burkett put this stork as an homage to him. That was his symbol. And he put it on his cars as a way of thanking him. Uh, let's open up the hood and see what we have. Let's maybe open on this side. We get a better view. So we do have to move this little light out of the way. All right. Here, go ahead. Very delicately. All right, all right. That is certainly one of the most beautiful engines of all time. The thing I love about Mark Burkett, notice the way no dirt or rain water or anything can be thrown up from underneath because the engine is pretty much sealed. And the great thing about these cars from the Nelicut is they run and they drive. This isn't something which has no crank or pistons and it just sits in a hall. This car gets used. They do an event every year where they take the cars out and they drive through. It's the big picnic. I don't know what they call it, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, very cool. I mean, look at, look at the manifolds. Notice the paint has not been burned off. You have dual water pumps on each side. He might have gotten that from Cadillac uh, at a V8 with dual water pumps. But so this thing always ran cool. Uh, pretty amazing. Single carburetor right there. But just the symmetry of it is just beautiful. Look at, look at this. So uh, yeah, two spark plugs per cylinder. It's yeah, a, so you have 24 spark plugs. That's right. right. Yeah, so. 9.4 liter uh, overhead valve V12. 
Right, and they made an 11 liter too that came a little later, but this one I think is the jewel. You had dual water pumps and you had dual scintilla mags also. On yes, this. sir. No distributor, two magnetos, so if you did lose battery power, you could keep running. I, it's, it, you know, it's just amazing uh, how fast this was for such a big car, you know? It's, it's amazing. Yeah, believe it or not, this is actually one of the fastest cars that you could buy in the world yeah. at, at the time it came out. Back in the day, you put a big engine in a big car. Duesenberg, big engine, big car. The idea of big engine, little car uh, didn't really come along until later. It seems almost, but they figure, why would anybody want that? You know, because the car was the status symbol. The bigger it was, exactly, the better. You yep. know. Well, hey, let's put this down before we both... Uh, have a heart attack. Okay, you, have you got it? <laughs> yeah, I got it. You look on my end. Okay. Yes, sir. And obviously, you open these little doors when it's hot to get the heat out of the motor. Or the engine. Motor means electric. No, I know. I know. I'll put this back. Put that back there like that. Let's open up and show them the interior of this car. As I said before, three-speed transmissions. If these had one fault, it may be that the clutches were a little weak for the power, but if you drove it properly, that was not a problem. And this top goes down. No, it doesn't go down. Uh, it comes off. Oh, it comes off. Oh, and actually, oh, it all lifts off. Yeah, there's, if you look under, there's uh, four little screws. If you take those off, and it'll just come off. And you have a sunroof too, right? Yep. So you have a sunroof and a roof that comes off. Yep. Wow. Okay, that's, well, that's interesting. Just a beautiful, as you can see. Rolls-Royce was the only one to put the picnic tables. They, they thought that was cool, and it was kind of cool, but you think maybe he got magazine pockets and things back here for this, but this, ugh. And the first owner of this one was, was a female, right? A lady owned it? Yes, she was a, a French uh, aviation pioneer back in her day. She was one of the very first women to uh, become a pilot. Uh, they used to call France. them aviatrix. Yeah, exactly. Let's just say, yes. She, uh, she was definitely um, ahead of her time for a lot of reasons. Her name, and I'm probably going to botch the pronunciation, but it, it was uh, Suzanne Deutsch de la Mute, right. a French woman. And uh, yeah, she bought this car brand new. Her father was... Her uh, father owned Shell Oil? Yeah, yeah. he was right. the founder of Shell Oil in right. France. And she owned this car for a number of years. It had a couple owners before uh, JB bought it in 1965. And you need to have your dad own Shell Oil to afford gas for this thing. <laughs> yeah, no I mean, one, one thing cars of this period were not, were fuel efficient. They figured if you could afford the car, pff, fuel was, was secondary. I mean, even at 25 cents a gallon, this thing could break you in a couple of weeks of just driving it every day. But it's just such a magnificent automobile. Beautifully styled, listen to this door. I mean, just, it's like a bank vault. And, and these, of course, are your trafficators. What that means is that when you put on the, you'll see when we get on the road, you put on the turn signal, the arm comes out and f flashes. Or maybe it just lights up. I don't know if it flashes. I know it lights up to signal that you're going to make a turn. Huge trunk, which is, <clears throat> again, in America back in the day, there would be a big leather box strapped here. I mean, how they've integrated the trunk into the bodywork uh, is, is pretty beautiful too. Even white walls were fairly unusual back in the day. Yeah, again, um, Hispano Suiza, they were very ahead of their time, and unfortunately, they were a very misunderstood yeah. company because the name was Spanish Swiss, but also they were, they were manufacturing in France, and it, it confused a lot of people, and unfortunately, I think that was yeah. part of their downfall as a company. And Mark Burkett was a pretty secretive guy. I mean, here's a guy born in March of, I think, 1878, and he died in 1953. I mean, that was quite an era to live, to go from an yeah. agricultural age where farming is the main source of income for most people. Oh, two Wright brothers fly this homemade plane. Just the age of achievement it was just unbelievable. And he was one of these intuitive geniuses, didn't suffer fools well at all. At all. He was Swiss, pretty private guy kept to himself a lot. So he doesn't get a lot of the fame that W.O. Bentley and, and I said Lanchester and some of the others get, but I think he was certainly one of the most brilliant ones. In fact, the very first sports car was built by him. It was called the King Alfonso because he was great friends with the, uh, the King of Spain. So he named the car after him. 
and it was the first light engine light car. The Mercer Raceabout was the first in America. And they sold thousands of those. They were hugely popular. And then he got involved in World War I in designing an air. And then he built this. And then it was mostly aircraft stuff from that point on. But this is an automobile engine truly built to aircraft standard. It's just, just an unbelievable car. Uh, let's see what else are we missing here. Uh, I think we're about ready to go for a ride. Can we take it for a ride? Let's do it, Dick. I'm very excited about this. This is really cool. You know my Hispano. I have a 1915 Hispano chassis with a 1915 uh, Hispano aero engine in it. Uh, and that's one of my all-time favorites. It's got probably close to 300 horsepower now. And it's, it just pulls so strong. And I'm anxious to see if there's any relation between these two. Great motor. Uh, we had it out yesterday uh, for a few hours. I was just saying it, it drives like a lazy boy, but it, it turns like a cruise ship. Wow. Beautiful transmission. Synchromesh, which was just came out in 1932. Cadillac was the first car to have it, but obviously he must have known somebody because it's in this one. Yep. And this car really was at the, the neck of the competition. And, and it really is fast. Yeah, I mean, she pulls. It, I'm trying to think what a modern equivalency would be. A modern equivalent might be like a, uh, maybe a Lincoln from the 90s, you know? A V8. It, it's just so effortlessly the way it pulls away. We, uh, last time this car was really out, we did about 80, maybe even 90 miles uh, total around Pebble Beach, modern right. area, yeah. and it just drove like a dream the whole yeah. time. It just, oh, it's wonderful. It's like, once it's moving, the steering, I, 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 would, I would never call it light, but it's right. <laughs> certainly not heavy. Yeah, not, once you get that, uh, I mean, that, that big V12 really just weighs it down on the oh, front yeah. tires. If you're at a oh, standstill, it's is, impossible to move, but. Oh, this thing is great, look at this. Suspension almost feels like a modern vehicle as well. I know. Well, it's what you call road hugging weight. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> a little he hunkers down. I mean, people sometimes forget when vehicles like this were built, the speed level was 40 to maybe 45 miles an hour. So to cruise at 50 or even 60, well, that was unbelievable. And this thing will effortlessly cruise at 70 or 80. Probably. Yeah, this car was capable of going over 100 miles an hour, yeah. which was insane for not only the time, but the weight and and everything. Uh, this car had 250 horsepower back in 1933. I mean, when people drove these back, they just put it in third gear and leave it there. And maybe when you came to a stop, you'd downshift down, but it certainly was not necessary. And it's hard to believe these are mechanical brakes. I, I mean, they feel just like... Uh, just like juice breaks. It's just a great amount of pull. It really does. I can't remember the last time one of these was sold. Do you remember any idea? Um, no, not a J12. There are uh, 120 of them made in total. Not sure how many exist today. Uh, I believe. People that have them hang on to them. I believe they're worth at least a couple million. Oh, uh, oh, oh, good God. You're probably looking at five to seven here. Yeah. And your great grandfather bought this in what, 65? Yep, 1965. He probably paid like 25,000. People thought he was crazy. Yeah. Because you don't forget, back in those days, the idea that you paid more for an antique car than a new car was crazy. My father goes, You buy a new Cadillac? What, what, what are you buying an old car? He, you know, why would an old car ever be worth more than a new yeah, and, and restoring an older car was even crazier yeah. back then. Yeah, this this car's restoration was done, I believe, 1976 or 1977, and it's held up pretty well over the years. And he, well, you realize, in 1915, there were 350 automobile manufacturers, and then we've lost 5% every, yo, every year since <laughs> then. And now, for the first time in years, new manufacturers, Lucid, Tesla, McLaren. Rivian. Yeah, Rivian, exactly. 
The transmission is so silky smooth. Like driving a brand new car, practically. I know. And some of the cars we've had that are from this era that you, you get them out and you drive them, you take them to a concourse, but the whole thing, it's just a, it's a, it's a pain. It, it's it, a chore, it it's hot, yeah, it's it, heavy, yeah, yeah. They're just really not, they don't want to work with you, but the, certain cars like this one, I mean, you could daily drive this if you were, if you really had the means to yeah. and wanted to. This is definitely one of the most favorite touring cars, though. You know, back in the day, there wasn't, there was a lot more to sell, to separate a rich car from a poor person's car, like a Model T, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, even if you buy a basic Toyota Corolla, it's got air conditioning, it's got electric windows. It's oh got yeah, it's heated, got everything. It's got, you know, and the fabrics are better, and it's up, but it, it's not, ultimately it does the same job. Whereas going from, you know, some twin cylinder crash bang car to this thing back in the house, it's like going from a biplane into a rocket. Right. This car, believe it or not, actually was one of the fastest cars in the world, and yeah. it had a whopping zero to sixty time of twelve seconds. That's right. Which at the even, time was fast. Even in the sixties, anything under ten seconds was very fast. So this car was purchased by my great grandfather uh, uh, from an a uh, agent who yeah. was a car hunter, basically, and he found it in London in 1964. And uh, so the car spent a decent amount of its life overseas in Europe. Uh, right until it came over to Los Angeles in the 60s, and it's been a good little SoCal car ever since. I wonder if it's been hidden, I wonder if it's hidden from the Nazi, because they tended to just take stuff like this. Right, we actually do have a car, uh, a 32 Maybach, the one that was we were supposed to bring it here. Right. Uh, that'll be for some other time in the future, but that car, actually, we found it in a barn in Poland. It was being looked for by the Nazis. Didn't find it, though. I wouldn't be surprised if this car was the same. I wonder what he paid for it in 65. I could, I could find that out. The, the one unfortunate thing is because it was a one-off body by Bender uh, with this wheelbase, we can't find uh, the original asking price for yeah. it from the, from the factory. I would guess around 20,000. Which would be what in now? About a quarter million. 20,000 20, would be about, yeah, about a quarter million, maybe a little over in today's oh, money. Way more, I think. Espano Suizas, they, they made such beautiful, intricate vehicles. It's a shame that they never really stood the test of time. Do you guys have an H6? We have two. Oh, I love those. I love them. Yeah, that, that was actually what I wanted to bring on. Yeah. We have a 1923 and a 1928 H6. I'd love to drive one of those. Oh, we could bring it on next. Yeah, that'd be fun. Now, the, the engines are just works of art. Oh, I know. It's crazy how well they actually run. They used to say Rolls-Royce was workmanship over engineering. I mean, this was so well put together. There wasn't anything tricky or unusual about the motors. They were just so intricately and beautifully made. Whereas Espano Sueza was engineered and beautifully made. I mean, it was just, you know, bevel drive, overhead cams, all kinds of stuff like that. Yep. In fact, the H6 is really based on the aero engine. It's just a six cylinder version. This is definitely one of my favorite cars to drive. Yeah. I remember in the clutch plates tended to flex on these a little bit. Yeah. But if you drive it properly, it's not I love looking at that big stork. Yeah, it's almost hard to watch the road. <laughs> I know, I know, you're just mesmerized. It's beautiful. Well, Cameron, thank you again for bringing this. This is just fantastic. Folks, if you get a chance, if you're ever in California, in Silmar, it's just right up the road from Burbank. It's about eight miles up the road. One of the greatest car museums in the United States, certainly one of the oldest. And uh, JB is one of the original collectors. So you'll see stuff from the, I guess, really the dawn of automotive collecting, which had to be the 50s or the 60s. So uh, just, just a great museum. A lot of one-off cars, a lot of things. If you like history, boy, it, 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 it's a great trip through time. So Cameron, thanks again, my friend. Thank you, Jay. Right. Always a see pleasure. See you guys next week. I love driving it.